Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another episode of Coffee Shop Philosophy. As always, I'm your host, Killian Hobbs, Managing Editor for Being Libertarian LLC, which includes beinglibertarian.com, think-liberty.com, rationalstandard.com, and of course, Champion Books, which does have its inaugural book out, Igniting Liberty, Voices for Freedom Around the World. If you haven't gotten a copy yet, I do suggest checking it out. And I think I mentioned this a few episodes ago. Uh, if you have the Amazon Prime account or the Prime Kindle account, I forget what they call it specifically, uh, you can actually read the audiobook for free, or not the audiobook, I should say, but the book itself. I've been listening to a lot of audiobooks lately, so it's been on my brain. But you can read the book for free um, if you have that uh, type of account, or you can order the book for ebook or actual hard copy as well. I'm going to dive right into the episode today. I'll save all the social media plugs and that for later on. Uh, today I'm joined with uh, TJ Eckert. Uh, TJ, say hello to everybody there. Hey, thanks for having me. Glad to have you on. Uh, TJ here is uh, formerly a copy editor, now the managing editor for Think Liberty. Uh, he's the one that actually took over for me as I moved into uh, the more general overview kind of stuff. Uh, so any of the articles that you've seen that have been coming out on Think Liberty, he's been the guy doing all the editing and scheduling and formatting in the background for it. Uh, he's been doing that for a couple weeks now. Uh, he's also a regular columnist on uh, being libertarian, that so you can go and check out any of the articles that he comes out with each and every week there. Uh, today's episode, this is uh, the second part in the series of specific philosophers that we're tackling. Uh, so in last week's episode, you may recall, uh, we dived into the works of Spinoza and some of his philosophies and ideas. And like I mentioned, we're not going in any particular order, so it's not a particular chronological order of this person links to this person or this person links over here. But rather, if there's a certain philosopher, a certain thinker in general that really sticks out as someone that I think we need to discuss or someone that I think we could use a better overview of, then those are the types of people that I want to discuss so we can bring that information to you. So the reason I got TJ on today is so that we can discuss Rothbard. Now, I already know that most of the people listening to this, considering this is a libertarian podcast, are probably very familiar with the works of Murray Rothbart, or at least familiar with the concepts. Quite often, there's quite a few people that aren't necessarily familiar with the works themselves. They might know the arguments or some of the ideas that have come out of it, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're well-versed in the works themselves or the actual nuances of the arguments that were used. And uh, I'm hoping here that uh, TJ can give me a hand as far as really diving into the the meat and potatoes of why Murray Rothbard became the figure that he is in libertarianism. So I, I guess I'll start off here, TJ. What would you say when it comes to Rothbard? What would you say was his most important work? His most important work? Man, I'd, I'd have to say man, economy, and state. I don't know. I'm not sure you could say anything else but that as far as most important goes. But although most people, I mean, at least for me, that one's a little tough one to get through. So a lot of people tend to save that one for last because he has so much, you know, so many other great works as well. So for me, my favorite is uh, I loved For New Liberty. I've probably read that book a good six times, I'd say. I usually try to read it once a year. And then you have the ethics of liberty. I mean, that, I know that's a lot of people's favorites. Anatomy of the state has got to be one of the easiest to get someone started on libertarianism. But I'd have to go with man, economy, and state as far as uh, his most influential. Yeah, I really liked that one. Um, you see, I'm, I haven't read everything by Rothbard yet myself. Um, I've read uh, man, economy, of state, anatomy of the state, and I'm currently working through ethics of liberty right now. Um, Are you telling me you haven't touched for new liberty? Is that what you're telling me? I haven't touched for a new liberty, actually. Wow. Uh, it's it's been on my list for a while, but uh, between you know editing through the articles as well as just trying to find different research pieces for this, that, the next thing, other projects that I've been working on, I've been it's slowly gotten bumped down the list as I've been going through books that I've been trying to catch up on because I uh, I found myself out of my normal reading pace. I usually get through, God. I think since I restarted getting right into reading, I'm at about just shy of 20 books this year right now. Wow. That's Some of them have been yeah. audiobooks, and not all of them have been philosophy or anything like that. But that's a sidebar and kind of off to the point there. Um, sorry? No, go ahead. You're, you're fine. I was just saying, you're reading it. I 
Now I was saying your your reading is very different than mine. I could never imagine getting all the way through Man Economy and State without touching some of the other Rothbard books first. I just wouldn't have wouldn't have been able to do it. Yeah. Yeah, no, um definitely a uh definitely an an important work. And what was really good with that book was that you start to see him you start to see him breaking away from Mises. Because a lot of the Austrian works up to that point had been very driven around classical liberalism and the kind of foundations behind minarchism. Um, but Rothbart really took it a little bit of differently by following some of the individualist anarchists. Uh, like he's very off to, uh, very often he would quote Spooner, uh, Lysander Spooner, and go through basically taking things to their logical conclusions. And I think that it's that kind of, that kind of systematic approach to his philosophy and to his thinking of trying to define everything very clearly, separate everything out as clearly as possible, and then break each section down that really contributed to why he is as renowned as he is inside of just general libertarian circles and libertarian history. Yeah, that's, um, you know, and, and Rothbard, one of the reasons that he's remembered today is his unapologetic nature. You know, he was not afraid to just tell, you know, I mean, look at the anatomy of the state. He was not afraid to just say, listen, you know, the government is theft writ large. And people, whoa, whoa. He, you know, he had, he had the balls to say that way back when. But ironically, uh, you know, Man, Economy, and State, actually, it's funny that you say he broke off from Mises because that book started as a way of once he um, became affiliated with, with Ludwig von Mises, someone had actually come to him and asked him to help write a textbook explaining human action. And he ended up expanding the works later on to basically encompass and become what is Man, Economy, and State. So... It's ironic that he would break from me for Mises, but actually the whole project kind of started as his way of explaining Mises. Yeah, and I mean that's the this is this is kind of the thing that happened. And I know from like my own experience, it was uh definitely not on the same intellectual level, of course, but it was the same thing when I started to get into classical liberalism and minarchism. By taking it to that logical extreme, it just kind of was, well, if we're going to say that any of this is theft, then all of it is theft. It doesn't make sense to cut some arbitrary line of what we're going to consider an acceptable amount of theft. There, there's no such thing as an acceptable amount of theft if we're going to view theft as a bad thing. So the only logical conclusion is to take it to anarchism, which I think, especially in later works, is he started to develop his own ideals instead of just uh, some of the critique works that he had done. Which, even though he was hit and miss later on in life, at least in my opinion, um, we'll have to we'll have to touch on that then because I'd be interested to hear what what you think was uh, the miss. Yeah, uh, we'll definitely touch on that a little bit later down. But his critique of systems I found practically flawless, and I know that there's a lot of people that even if they consider themselves somewhat anarcho capitalist, are not necessarily Rothbard fans. But the way that he could view the entirety of a system and actually pin it down and start taking it apart, I found that that was just the – it was one of the more beneficial approaches to how our relations with the state, how our relations in society work. Uh, I guess guess we'll shelve that because, again, we'll get to the – some of the argumentation stuff of his a little bit later on. Uh, we were talking this uh, just a bit before we started recording here. What is your take on the free market of children? <laughs> <laughs> Why did I know you were going to jump into that? I, I have to cover it because it's <laughs> other than uh, other than some of the Think Liberty folk uh, defending Hayek. Other than that, it's it's one of the the biggest ones that people jump on when they're taking a crack at uh, when they're taking a crack at Rothbard. The people that tend to jump on this Rothbard and the child markets thing seem to be the ones that never actually read it. Because if you read that, not you know, within its own context, it's not. I would say it's not bad at all. It's really you know, with with Rothbard, he came to explain just about everything, and he left no stone unturned. So when people came up with the idea of hey, he you know, he knew eventually someone was going to ask if if someone wants to give up their child, you know, where does this go? And he had no problem taking it to its logical conclusion and talking about how that there would be markets for things like that. It's it's very, I would say it's almost boring compared to how most people like to paint it as, as this terrible thing where it's, oh my God, we'd have like child slavery or we'd have these, these weird, you know, trafficking situations that you see today. 
with, um, you know, the state and things like that, which is not what he ent- entailed at all. So, mm-hmm. Like, I, I found the most interesting thing with that when you go to the actual passage and you read the, you read it in the context of the entire work. He very clearly states that, could it be morally reprehensible? Sure. Could it be ethically reprehensible? Certainly. Should it be legally reprehensible in a libertarian model? No. So he made it, he makes a very clear point of separating what should and shouldn't be legal versus what should and shouldn't be considered right or what should and shouldn't be considered wrong. Yeah. And that's, it's something that libertarians, especially people who are new to libertarianism, have a problem kind of separating the, the prescriptive versus the descriptive discussion that, in, especially that Rothbard entails. Because if you read in like For New Liberty, he talks about a lot of different ways that maybe um, older societies had dealt with laws and things like that. And certain behaviors that, like you said, should be legally like a crime. No, but would they be faced with social ostracism, things like that? Absolutely. And it's like, you know, you, you, you could sit there and just say, oh, well, he just wants child markets, you know? And it's like, well, no, that's not, that's not what he's saying. There's a difference between saying someone should be thrown in a cage and saying that this person, you know, what they're doing should be applauded, you know? And it's a lot of people have trouble separating that today. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like, um, I, I view the argument as a, as almost a logical extension of the, you know, I want there to be charity. I want people to help people. I dislike immensely and I find it morally reprehensible that the state does it at the end of a barrel of a gun. It's the same idea. It's not, it's legally, like from a legality perspective and a systemic perspective, should there, you know, should that be a thing? No, no, it shouldn't. But it doesn't mean that, you know, on a moral level, I'm against charity simply because I'm against state enforced welfare at the hands of taxation. Yeah. And that's ironically, it's, it's something that's, you know, even Bastiat handled this uh, <laughs> almost 200 years ago, where it's, it's like just because we don't want, public education doesn't mean that we don't want people to be educated. We're not like, oh no, will you educate your children? What are you insane? They should be go working in fields. What are you talking about? It's like, no, that's not what I mean when I say that public education needs to be done away with, you know, and people can't separate that, especially when it came to Rothbard. And I think part of it is because of how unapologetic he was. He just kind of didn't care. It was like, you know, listen, I'm going to, he was not going to be, I guess, when when it came to being thorough and not having, you know, allowing someone to have that gotcha moment with him, he was, Mm He was the king of that, as far as I'm concerned. That was something he was not going to, he was not going to leave anything unturned. Yeah, I would kind of consider him the polar opposite of uh, Nozick in that sense. Because a lot of the stuff that uh, Nozick wrote, and I think it's one of the reasons why um, general establishment um, academia preferred Nozick's work was because it was very open-ended. It wasn't really defended. It was more of a, hey, here's an idea kind of presentation it was kind of like there's good stuff in his work but it was kind of wishy-washy whereas on the extreme opposite end of the same libertarian spectrum you've got murray rothbart saying this is what a property is this is what a right to a property is this is how you acquire a right to a property this is what it entails you can do this is what it does not entail you can do here's how it works in this situation this situation this situation this situation this situation here's what this person got right this here's what this person got wrong just very boom, 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 boom to the letter on every point where he tries to, he tries to make sure that there's no room for error in his, in the interpretation of what he views libertarianism to be in its very distilled form. And that's, I mean, that's, that's a good thing though. I mean, I, I would, I could imagine that just about every libertarian listening to this right now at some point has been pushed into a has allowed their views basically to take them to a place that's uncomfortable as far as pushing their what their norms are and things like that and that's what Rothbard's best known for I mean that's that's what he did so as far as that goes I mean that's I think that's one of the reasons that makes him great is it's you know he's unapologetic about it now speaking of uh speaking of being unapologetic for it uh oh. We're going to go into, I guess we'll go and cover some of those uh, critiques that I mentioned earlier. Some of the issues that I find, so to speak. Sure, sure. Now, I know most people usually jump into uh, 
a lot of people jump into the critique section in Ethics of Liberty, right? Uh, most notably, there was an episode of the Think Liberty podcast where they actually covered um, chapter 28, where he specifically goes after um, Hayek's uh, definition of coercion. Yeah, I highly recommend checking that episode out. I was on that one. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a great episode on it. Um, and he does the same thing with other ones. But the the one that stuck out with me, uh, as far as a critique was concerned, uh, was when he tried to challenge Hume's guillotine. Okay, you're talking the is ought jump here? Is it? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when he tried to challenge that by saying that uh, you could ignore the existence of it based on the fact that you can have a value-to-value system. I found that to be I, – I found I'm, I'm oversimplifying it here because I can't remember the exact uh, wording of the argument, uh, which I know since we already covered it is kind of something that's necessary with Rothbard sometimes. But uh, he, he tried to make the argument that by connecting – by working off of a pure valued system, you don't have to worry about is oughts simply because you're going strictly from one value to another value, in which case – I, I think that that kind of skirts around it. it. It's kind of a non sequitur because he's talking at that point about is is. He's not yeah. talking. He, he's not talking about. He's either talking is is or he's talking ought ought. In which case, Hume's guillotine doesn't address either of that. It just addresses the is to the ought. Yeah, it kind of becomes a non sequitur where it's like you were talking two different issues. Yeah, I mean, it's luckily, funny. I'm, I'm sitting here with ethics liberty in my hand right now, trying to flip to this page real quick, but <laughs> yeah. It's like he he didn't – like luckily he didn't build anything on it. It was just more of a, a minor critique of the idea of it simply because the problem with Hume's guillotine is that anything that looks even slightly objective usually falls before Hume's guillotine, uh, whether it's um, categorical imperatives from Kant or even trying to start the basis of having an entire society that's – built on a very specific law or a very specific system, it all starts with having to agree upon that system. And I don't sure. I mean, that's that, what happens with the, non, look at the non-aggression principle. Yeah. And that's, I don't think Rothbart was a fan of having, of having it be that wishy-washy. Cause again, he was a very, you could almost say he was um, absolutist in many ways. It was very, there has to be a system for this and this is how it looks. It can't be purely subjective. I mean, market values and like that can be subjective because the system of how a market works is concrete in a free market. It is people own things and they exchange things. And this is how contracts and the like work. And he spells it all out the way that he's most famously spells everything out, which is, I think, again, why he was as prominent as he was. Yeah, I think I would disagree with you, though, a little bit. I, I think... His works were that were set up that way. His writing style was set up that way, and his 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 principles are set up that way. But he kind of was able to separate himself from that, in that he recognized that you know that wasn't for sure how things would work out. You know, all of us certainly not all around, but even even in limited kind of societies where he knew that, like in Ancapistan, for example, let's say, I don't think he would really. Uh, say that you know this is for sure how it's going to happen, and this this is how it should even how it should happen. I should say. But right. No, I, I I should clarify that actually is that's a very good point. I should clarify on that. He himself was able to separate it. But I found at least in the works that I've gone through that he worked. He always started from a very set starting point, And then a lot of stuff that came out after Woods was in some way, shape or form, very absolute based on that sure, as sure. an actual yeah. person, that's I guess, in some of the um like outside of his primary works, just in general discussions or um, things like that. That's where you kind of see him separating himself and being able to point out that, you know, okay, we don't have the system, but we could have this system or this system, or it could play out this way, or people could agree on this, which I think, the, and then that ties back into uh, what we were talking about a little earlier about people misunderstanding Rothbart. I think that when we're looking at, uh, when we're looking at some of his works and, we're seeing that kind of absolution. Do you see it in the way that it inspires some and caps? I mean, well, I mean, TJ, why don't you give me a, you could probably give me a couple <laughs> examples here of, uh, and caps gone bad because they've misinterpreted Rothbart. 
<laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to give names if that's what you're looking for, but no, 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 we're not going to drop names, of course, but I'm pretty sure we could go back and forth and explain some pretty bad options that people come up with based on it. Yeah. So a lot, in my opinion, I think a lot of people, you see this like argument that there's a libertarian to alt right, or you see people that even people that go to like the Bernie Sanders camp and they're like, I've seen a lot of people that go, oh yeah, I, libertarianism. Oh, I used to be, yeah, I used to be one of those. Yeah. It's stupid for this, this, or this reason. And it's the, the problem is people tend to read things like Rothbard. You know, you can read the anatomy of the state, some simple works and you, you don't really allow yourself to see past your own biases or even let's just say you, you don't really fully comprehend what they were saying. Like we talked about earlier with the difference between, you know, the descriptive and prescriptive uh, discussions and what people end up doing is completely misinterpreting it and then just kind of rejecting it on the face of it, rejecting what would be a, considered a straw man of what Rothbard wrote, for example, like the, the child markets, and then moving past libertarianism and being like, oh, well, this is flawed for this reason. And it's like, well, no, because you didn't really even understand. Like, I, you know, how many people could you say like, oh, yeah, when it comes to libertarianism, I used to be libertarian, but then I realized that child markets are stupid. And it's like, well, sweet. If that's your deepest <laughs> kind of... Yeah. If you found you a person wrong, yeah. that said that, if you found someone who said that, then tell that person off, not an entire ideology. Yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, sweet. Like if that's that's your deepest concern or criticism of libertarianism. You weren't really ever a libertarian. <laughs> so and, and a lot of times that can happen when you get when you try to hash out these really, really I mean, the stuff that Rothbard would go down to and when we're talking like in the weeds here is so I, I would say borderline petty on some issues and it's, yeah. you know, a lot of people you get, you lose them, you know, you start to lose them and it, it happens. So that's one of the problems with libertarianism though. Like uh, Dave Smith always says, I love that he says libertarians usually have what's OCD obsessive consistency disorder. Mm -hmm. And you know, a lot of people don't, they find libertarianism because they like some of the things they say. And then when you start getting into the consistency of it, where you really need to libertarianism is almost always going to push you into a, a place where you're going to feel uncomfortable in your views. And if yeah. you're not ready for that, or you don't want to feel that way, or if that's not what led you to libertarianism is trying to be that consistent and break things down, you're probably going to reject it on some, I'm going to say some level that would be considered a straw man, honestly. Yeah. It's either going to be a straw man or it's going to be just an arbitrary, I don't like how this is, so I'm no longer going to support it. Yeah. But those are kind of like the two lines that you can really walk away from the ideology once you've really dived into it and seen how the arguments break down. Yeah. And we see this with the left and the right, you know, here it's, you know, go to, go talk to someone on the right and tell them that, um, you know, one of the best ways to combat the drug war is to legalize all drugs. They, whoa, you know, whoa, no way we can't do that. You know, you get these old conservatives that don't want to deal with it or look at liberals and say, listen, the best way we, I want to help the poor, you have to believe me. And the best way we could do that would be to get rid of the minimum wage, mm -hmm. you know, get rid of these licensing laws. And they, whoa, you know, they, they sit there and they, you're immediately pushing them into, into an uncomfortable worldview. And instead of grappling with it, logically, they just kind of reject it. You know, they put up their walls and they tend to move on and they just tell themselves, yeah, I, I dealt with that. And that was just stupid. And it's, that's why I'm not libertarian. And it's, you know, it's a shame, honestly. Yeah. Speaking of disagreeing with Rothbard, though, uh, as you know, I got to mention this one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to mention this one. Perfect. Uh, in the Ethics of Liberty, uh, I think it's chapter 23 or 24. Um, I might be wrong on the chapter number here. Just okay, trying I'm to. I'm going to sit. I got it. I got my contents open right here. So. Perfect. Uh, in the in one of the um, in one of those chapters, uh, he pulls up and he makes the argument that um, I'm trying to remember the wording here because again the wording is important. He makes the argument that the state exists. It's we're not uh, we're not in the Caruso situation that he starts the book off with. We know we are we are in a world where we have to work within the matrix of a state existing. Mm -hmm. So the idea of having you know a lot of libertarians arguing against voting or against participation like that because they view voting as a form of participation and as almost a conscious choice to participate in the system. Rothbard countered this by saying that, well, no, the state exists and the state's going to exist whether you vote or not. We have to work with the means at hand. It's not immoral to use voting because it's part of the state. Yeah, simply you're because about, you can't yeah, 24 there 24 yeah yeah the moral simply because he, relations to the state where he's talking about that 
Yeah, and it's you can't it can't be considered an immoral act because for something to be a moral act, you have to be in a situation where you're truly free to make moral choices. But the will of the state is going to be enforced upon you, in which case you have to work with what you're given, in which case voting is a tool that you can work with in that sense. So what would what what's your what's your take on that particular argument? Sure. So <laughs> As you know, I am not a fan of voting. I don't vote. It hasn't always been that way, but I, you know, I no longer do. I understand his argument. I just don't necessarily agree that it's going to, I just don't agree that the outcome is going to be there. It's yeah, I I agree with his statement, right? So he talks about how you can talk, um, for example, like voting no on a tax bill is not necessarily a a wrong thing to do because you're not really, because a lot of people say that you're empowering the state and things like that. You're partaking or you're aggressing against others. And that's not the case, you know, because you're not voting in, in, in the positive sense of things. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, but what I don't, the reason I don't really buy into it is just because I don't see it being effective. You know, it's his reasoning is there, his logic is there. It's just, I think he kind of overstated that, like, I don't know, the easiest way you can, you can, I can break it down is that you're never going to vote yourself free. It's just the, that the way it's going to work. You know, politics is the the failure of persuasion. That's what it is in its very essence. So to say that you're going to eventually reach a conclusion that is going to be freedom or uh, not coercion, you know, a lack of coercion is, is just kind of nonsensical in my head. But where he was going with it, saying that, you know, it could be moral. It's, it's not exactly immoral is I would agree. You know, there, there are instances where you could do, where you could say that's the case. I just don't think the effectiveness is there, especially coming from Rothbard who went down that road of voting. And it's in one of his more pragmatic arguments, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, I just don't agree that it's even for being a pragmatic approach. It's very, it's not, it's just not going to be effective. Yeah, no, it's, uh, I guess you could say that uh, Rothbard needed to read uh, Mencken. (laughs) <laughs> yeah i mean I, I guess i'm sure he did he was a big fan of Mencken, so yeah I, i'm rather sure he did but uh no i mean i'm you know his idea of consent though in, in regards to the state is really something that i that i enjoy though i'm writing a book on consent right now and one of the things that people tend to not understand is the difference that consent plays when the state is involved the state is a way of just like with property rights they throw they throw a wrench in the mix and it screws everything up you know we could talk about property rights and then you start talking about public property and it's like, oh, now we need to come up with a whole nother set of ideas and all this stuff just to cope with the idea of public property, you know, the state ownership of things like that. And it, it's the same thing with consent. If we were talking about a bunch, a, a completely privatized society, consent becomes cut and dry. But like mm-hmm. you said, when, when you're existing, you're already existing in a state and you have to grapple with that reality. Now you add this whole other level, this another layer of consent that you have to deal with. And it's it, it muddies the waters, to yep. say the least. <laughs> well, it's uh, and just to clarify, uh, I'm assuming that uh, it's a consent in the sense of actually actively choosing things, because I know, uh, especially in especially with the way people hear libertarians talking about consent, they usually assume the worst because of, well, because of that free market section that uh, we discussed earlier. Um, But it should be understood that, of course, this is why the the terminology becomes important. uh, Because at that point, you have to say, this is what we're talking about. This is the term. This is what it applies to and really break it down, which I'm sure uh, you have a, uh, you probably don't have a working title for that yet, do you? Uh, Working title? No, not, I mean, it's, yeah, basically, it's going to be consent and then the political, economic, and sociological implications thereof, but is basically how it's going to be worded. But, but I've released a, a chapter here and there as far um one of them is is published on Mises Institute's website. So, and it's the state's, the the odd case of consent with the state and things like that. And it's it basically just, it kind of dives into this and how there's this weird uh, twist in how people look at consent when it comes to the state. Mm-hmm. So... The reason being is, you know, in today's in today's society, you you'll be hard pressed to find somebody that will look you straight in the eyes and say, "Yeah, I don't give I don't give a crap about consent." You know, most people would be like, "Whoa," you know, you, you're almost shunned from polite society at that point. And I think that that's a good thing because consent is libertarians ace in the hole. We can there. It's very hard to say when you get into the weeds of it that any philosophical group cares about 
consent more than libertarians do. And that's a good way to reach out to people because it's a way to kind of get their guard down and be like, oh, well, yeah, I care about consent. Okay, well, then here's how this should kind of walk you down the path of coming towards what we what we believe in, you know? So yeah. here's how this entire organization that has been running the country, it literally survives on the fact that it is assuming your consent and ignoring your any any kind of uh, step away from that or any disagreement with it. Yeah. And it comes down to defining consent. So for most people, they, they would agree. They'd say, what do you mean? You have my consent. You know how many times you <laughs> the, the social contract that we consent to design oh. all this implicit <laughs> consent. And the thing is, is that I, I just ask people, I say, what, well, how do you define consent? What, what gives consent its value? You know, what, if I told you that I consent to do this, why does that hold any value with you? And, and the reason that what it comes back down to is that consent is only made valuable through the ability to withdraw it from someone completely. Mm -hmm. You know, and I tell, I'll tell a girl, for example, or a guy, you know, it's easy to say, Hey, you asked that girl for a number. Why, why did you get a rush of feelings when she gave it to you? And you felt, you felt so good. And you walked away, you're like, yeah, I got that girl's number. It's like, cause she could have told you no when you asked for it. You know, you didn't, if you walked up to her and just put a gun to her head and said, give me your number or something ridiculous. You're not really just, did you just quote Kyle? (laughs) (laughs) You you can do whatever you want. You could shoot someone in the face and no one will care. Oh, I was, was listening funny. to this. That was a good exchange. I did have a good time. So, yeah, but no, that was a good episode. You do have to, yeah. It was. I had a good time. I, um, but you, you have to recognize that there is value in consent, and and people tend to completely overlook the notion that that value is held only in the ability to withdraw it and withdraw it completely. And that's where the line comes from in the state with consent is that you you don't have the ability to withdraw it. So even saying, oh yeah, I consented between voting for. Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, you really, it's a very wishy-washy idea to say that that consent was really, would really hold water. Yeah. Is it really a choice if you had to choose between cancer and AIDS? Yeah. I mean, that's especially when choosing neither wasn't on the, on the table. Exactly. That's why you have to be able to withdraw consent. And when I tell people it that way, they tend to, oh, wow, that makes sense. And I go, yeah. I mean, every woman knows what it's like to be accosted by a man that they didn't want around. And every guy has usually been in some sort of situation, let's say it was a fist fight they didn't want to be in, that they they really wish they could have withdrawn their consent from that and, and you know, just left the situation. And it's it tends to bring people, it makes it easy for people to, to digest. So mm-hmm. uh, we'll definitely keep an eye out for that one there. Um, so I'm going to wrap everything up here. Uh, I guess the last thing I'll put out to you there is if there was one key takeaway from the works of Rothbard that, you know, people in the audience should try to look for or try to research a little more on or try to read up on. If there was one key takeaway or one key argument or thing that he contributed, what would that be? I would say it would be in the the way he was able to break down libertarianism and provide historical examples of them. Because Rothbard was not just an economist. He was best known for being, you know, a historian. He was a great historian. And when you read through his works, you start to get all these examples of little bits that man, libertarianism worked here. And, and you talk about Austrian business cycle theory and he'll talk about, you know, everyone talks about how it, you know, the great depression and how FDR saved us. But then you read Rothbard and you're like, wow, what about these unaccounted for uh, crashes that nobody really knows that really ended up turning around because it, it kind of solidifies the the notion of the underlying argument behind Austrian business cycle theory, for example. And um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that you have, if you are going to read Rothbard, you have to look into what his series called Conceived in Liberty. And it's a complete historical analysis of the the, con- the pre-colonial days of America and things like that. And they just came out with the, his newest. It's so funny. He's been dead for 20 plus 20 plus years. They're still publishing new books of his. That's how much he's written. So he has a, the newest um, volume of it. I believe it's volume six or, or five. I believe it. Forgive me if I'm wrong there, but it's going to be coming out. And it's 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 so crazy how he was able to intertwine historical examples with the idea that libertarianism is the proper way, you know, the Austrian business cycle, things like that. And I think that's his biggest, to me, that was, that would be his biggest takeaway is how he kind of inter- in, like interconnected the two. Mm-hmm. No, definitely. Uh, it's one of the things that it, uh, it really built a backbone, you know, obviously he was predicated by a bunch of different philosophers that came well before him. I mean, Mills was well before him. Locke was well before him. Um, Mises was before him, so on and so forth. If you go up the chain, I, he obviously referenced Spooner a lot. There's tons of, in that history, there's tons of people that came before him, but 
he really cemented down what libertarianism looks like today. And I think that that's a key takeaway as well. Um, and like you said, showing the history that this is not just some crazy crackpot idea that came out in the last, you know, 60, 70 years, showing that there's a long history of examples of this exact thing happening, that knowing that there is a history to it, knowing that it's been tried before and worked, I think that that's something that's very powerful for people who see the state as something kind of overbearing and undefeatable. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, just to wrap everything up here, um, thank you again for coming on, TJ. Uh, it was excellent talking to you. I'll definitely have you on as a guest again sometime in the future. Um, do keep an eye out for the uh, book that he's working on, on the consent there. Uh, that'll definitely be an interesting read when that comes out. And I'm definitely going to make a mention of it on the show here as soon as it does. Uh, you can follow us, like I said, on all forms of social media. Um, you can go to our website to uh, check that little bell so that you get the uh, daily notifications whenever new articles come out on either beinglibertarian.com, think-liberty.com, or rationalstandard.com. Uh, you can follow myself personally on Facebook uh, just by searching Killian Hobbs Author. Uh, I've got a page on there, and you can follow me there. Uh, and always, if you liked what you heard and you'd like to hear more, I'll see you again next week. 